Okay, let me walk you through tonight. Uh, I'm going to use this bad microphone and um, give you an overview of, of what the EPA has issued, right, their draft rule. And then I'm going to um, uh, turn, turn it over to um, my coworker, Garrett Martin, and he's going to walk you through a model that DEQ created to, that analyzes various ways. Oh, I'm just going to holler. I'm really just going to holler. I'm sorry. So then I'm going to turn it over to Garrett, and he is come up to here. Will you work a PowerPoint for me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's coming. Uh, okay, so let's start over. So I'm Tracy Stone Manning, the director of DDQ, and I'm going to walk you through what we're doing tonight. Um, as you all know, the EPA issued uh, a draft rule to reduce carbon emissions from power plants. They did that uh, back in June. And the governor asked us to, at DEQ, to, to put that into some kind of Montana context. It's 647 pages long, and he said, hey, what would this mean for Montana? Um, so we did that, and we wrote a white paper sort of analyzing various options that we could walk through. Um, so we'll walk through those. Um, Garrett, Martin, uh, our energy analysts, will then walk through the <coughs> that we created that helped get us to those that analysis. And then we'll turn it over to a, a panel of stakeholders um, for a short uh, discussion with them. Then we open it up to you for a Q&A. Um, and I need to be clear, this is not a public hearing. We're talking about a draft rule. Um, but it is a public conversation. So thank you all for coming. Time is precious, and you are giving us yours. And um, we sure appreciate it. So we're here to discuss, as I said, these new proposed rules from EPA. Um, and I need to be clear, we are not the Environmental Protection Agency. We are from the Montana Department of Environmental Quality. And at DEQ, we implement federal laws for clean air and clean water. And so when this rule becomes final, it will be our job to implement it. And as I mentioned, the governor asked us to, um, to take a deep, hard look at what this could mean for Montana. And we're, so we're not here to present a plan. The, the white paper that you picked up outside that has five different options is not a plan. Um, it's an analysis. We haven't created a plan yet because we don't have a final rule. Um, and because we need to hear from you first, right? We need to hear from Montanans about what the appropriate path forward is for our energy future. But let's um, get to how EPA came up with this rule. Uh, we all, everyone in this room gets to comment to the EPA about the rule, so we thought it might be a good idea to give you some context about how they got there. And bear with me, I am going to try to condense 647 pages of federal rule into about five minutes. Um, but I think you'll have a sense by the time we're done. So the proposed targets uh, are based on math. What you see ahead of you is um, Montana's 2012 carbon dioxide emission rate. <coughs> and in order to get to the, the target, EPA looked at all of our nine um, uh, electrical generating units. They added the carbon emitted per megawatt hour from those generating units to our existing renewables and came up with 2,245 pounds of carbon dioxide per megawatt hour. And then they looked at a bunch of different things, steps to take that they think would be appropriate to reduce the carbon. Uh, they, they did the math on those steps and came up with what they believe Montana can achieve, which is 1,771 pounds of carbon dioxide per megawatt hour. That's a 21% reduction for us. And if this rule were to become final, we would need to get to that number by the year 2030. OK, but how do we get there without, um, as that graphic just did, lopping off the high line? Um, we, uh, we, we would like to, 
and I used you guys in Western Montana in, in Cold Strip. I said, how do we get there without lopping off Western Montana as you guys would want to do? <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, <laughs> um, the answer is um, is in part um, steeped in the rule itself. The EPA used um, those measures that I talked about that they used to get to the target, they call building blocks. And so the first uh, building block is energy efficient, uh, efficiency improvements at coal units themselves, right? Making, uh, just getting better at producing power, being more efficient. Second block is dispatching from coal uh, power plants to natural gas power plants. We don't have any of those combined cycle plants in Montana, so this second building block doesn't really um, pertain to us today. The third one is to increase low and or no carbon power. So that's things like wind power and solar power and uh, nuclear power. And the fourth thing is to increase the energy efficiency in our homes and in our businesses so that we use less power and less carbon to begin with. All those things stack up to hit that 1,771 megawatt pounds of CO2 per megawatt target. Um, now this graphic, um, I need you to not take literally. Um, it's really more for <laughs> illustration. But it shows you how we can, we have the flexibility to use the building blocks however we want. Right, so we could, on the left, use each building block evenly, or we could use three of them and really rely heavily. We could do that all the way through. There's innumerable options that we could do with these building blocks. Or, as this last one shows, we can add a different building block all together. Kind of a jumble, that's not what we want to do. But the point is, um, EPA used the building blocks to set our target. We don't have to use the building blocks to meet the target. Um, we get to meet the target however we choose. Right? And so that's the work ahead for Montana, putting together a plan that makes sense to get to the target of one that, if it were final, of, of 1771. So it's great that the um, that the EPA has given us the flexibility to, to, to do our own plan. It means we're going to have to do a lot of work. So again, uh, Governor Bullock asked us at DEQ to analyze how we can meet this draft rule. Um, and doing that analysis will not only inform his comments to the EPA, because once you dig in and say, what would this rule really mean for us? You learn things. You can put those into the comments to EPA. But it, inf it will inform our um, conversation with the public so that we have a Montana context to talk about. Um, and the white paper that you might have picked up says, for discussion purposes only, on every single page. And it says that for a reason. It says, really, for discussion only. I, uh, you do not have a plan in your hands. You have um, analysis and ideas of what could be. Um, and there are five scenarios in it, all of which are hypothetical, all of which keep our existing coal plants open. So the five different options, much like these building blocks, um, use a variety of different things. Our existing power generation today, plus a bunch of renewables. Our existing power generation today, plus a bunch of energy efficiency our existing power today, plus perhaps co-firing at the Lewis and Clark uh, facility out in Sydney, um, our existing power today, plus perhaps 20% of carbon capture at coal strip. All, everything's on the table, because how we get to the target is our own business. Um, for you technical folks, the math looks like this. Let me step out of the way. Um, <coughs> Pretty straightforward and also pretty not straightforward, but basically it's a numerator and a denominator. Um, and whatever Montana does ultimately will boil down to this math equation on whether or not we'll be able to hit our number. So before I turn it over to Garrett to walk through the model that we created to get through this analysis, um, let me walk you through the steps ahead. So here we are today in Missoula, Montana. Uh, by December 1st, we, um, we need to get comments to the Environmental Protection Agency. 
They then will issue a final plan, a final rule rather, by June of 2015. We have one year to put together our plan to prove to the EPA that we've got a plan that's going to work. Uh, that takes us out to 2016. We can ask for an extension to 2017. Then, if it makes sense for us to be in some sort of multi-state or regional um, relationship, uh, which will be add a layer of difficulty, we can get another year's extension to 2018. So the point here is that we've got some time, um, and uh, and we need that time because it's complicated. It's easy, but it's also complicated. Um, the the goal, uh, the the idea behind the goal is relatively straightforward. Hitting that goal is uh, is going to take work with all of you. Um, so after uh, we walk through the model, we're going to do, like I said, the panel, and then we'll do Q&A. And then, of course, afterwards, we can um, mill around and talk to one another. And several, many of my coworkers are here from the Department of Environmental Quality. Please raise your hands so people can see. Thank you. Um, so feel free to talk to any of them. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to Garrett to run through the model. But is Kristen in the room? Of course she is. <laughs> Kristen wrote the model. Kristen. There she is. Um, Kristen wrote the model that you are about to um, see, and you can play with at home. You can download. Um, Garrett is going to walk us through um, all of the data in it. So I'm going to try. Does this help at all? I'm, I have to use the computer here because I'm running a tool. Um, but I can either speak up really loud or just work with this. Yeah. Yeah. Seems like a person. No, yeah. that's, not no, that's not so good. So does this help at all, or should yeah. I just speak yeah. up? Yeah. Well, we'll try this. And if not, um, on Tenet, we, um, the, our team, we read the 645-page report. It was double-spaced, so it wasn't quite so long. But And then also the thousands of pages of technical supporting documents that were in addition to that, and as well as a bunch of spreadsheets. And uh, once we read that, we understood what the, the EPA w was asking, at least in general terms. Uh, we wanted to check their math and to make sure that what they had attributed for the state of Montana, both our generation, our CO2 emissions, and then how those things worked going forward to 2030, and in, to make sure that the targets they set for us made sense and that the math worked out for us. So we started putting together a spreadsheet. Once we started doing that, we realized this spreadsheet could be so much more. We could start using the spreadsheet with some ingenious coding to start doing a sensitivity analysis to figure out if we did a little more of something here, what, what might that allow us to do less of and still achieve compliance. So you know, I work a lot on renewables. I'm pretty bullish on, on renewables. So if we do more on renewables, what does that maybe mean we get in terms of breathing room to if we can't achieve this, the energy efficiency levels that they thought we might be able to hit um, for, uh, that the EPA thought we could do here in Montana? Or maybe we're not able to achieve the heat rate improvements at the coal plants that they have forecasted for us. And so we wanted to test that out. And so we built a tool that is designed to be tinkered with, to throw out a couple of ideas, come back here to this is the overview slide and see is does that work if it doesn't go back tinker a little bit more and, and work uh, work the scenario until you come up with something that you like and that will achieve compliance with what the EPA is shooting for um, so with that I'll start I'm gonna throw a ton of information uh, at you in the next 10 minutes I apologize uh, the AV situation in every way I, I wish you guys were at Billings last night. We had great giant screens and good mics, and but we'll push through. Uh, but the point, uh, the, what, the main point I want you to get out of this is that this tool, you can go home and you can download. If you go to the DEQ website, there is a, on the news, um, current news at, at DEQ, right in the middle of the page, there's going to be a headline that says, information on options for Montana's energy future which is, announces this meeting as well as the two prior ones. And in the, in the middle of that announcement, there's a link to this tool, which you can download, and you can look through our own scenarios, and you can create your own. And we definitely encourage you to do that. 
And if you come up with a really great idea that wasn't reflected in our own scenarios, you should send it to us because we're very eager to hear what everyone else um, has to say about where they think the state should go in their implementation plan. Um, a couple of orders of business before I get into this. When you, when you download this, when you go home and you start playing with it, you're going to get at the top um, here of the, of the Excel spreadsheet, you're going to get a little orangey yellow warning bar and a little, a little button that says enable macros. You're going to need to push that button in order to make this tool work. Um, otherwise, all the ingenious coding doesn't do anything. Oh, maybe. Um, but um, the next important thing to note is that there is, on each of the tabs of this tool, a little link that says instructions. And if you click on that, it pops up the instructions for that particular tab. It tells you what's going on. and probably can do a better, more comprehensive job of explaining this to you than I can in the next few minutes. Um, and that's present on all the sheets. Um, this the tool already has a bunch of um, scenarios already loaded into it, which are here. You guys probably can't see that, but they're there. And um, you can pick one, and you press the Import Save button, and it'll uh, after a few seconds, it'll bring that particular scenario up, um, and um, there'll be a little thing that says Im Analysis Imported. Um, and there you go. And so, but the most important thing on this overview uh, tab is in the green lettering right here. And even though you can't see what the numbers say or even what the words probably say back there, um, the green is all you really need to know. Green means your scenario is compliant with what the EPA's targets are. If those letters go to red, it's out of compliance and you need to go back and you tinker a little bit more. <coughs> so we designed this tool to achieve the rate-based target that they have given us in the draft rule. But in the draft rule, they also said that you can convert that emission rate target over to a mass of emissions target uh, for 2030. And so we've also structured this tool to kind of, to kind of auto-compute what that mass target is going to look like. And I'm going to try the mic again. This? Uh, no? Okay. I didn't think so. <laughs> So this particular scenario, um, we're in compliance both on the mass and the, uh, the rate side of things. And the other thing to say, to kind of talk about, is these two graphs. Uh, the one on the left here is showing uh, what all the resources are that are going in to meet that particular standard. Almost all of them, the, the EGUs, which are the coal power plants, are going to be the dominant slice of the pie in all of them because they are the dominant. Uh, form of electricity outside of hydro um, in, the, in the state, and hydro is just ignored in, in the rule. It's not in the target, it's also not in the baseline. And if we included it in the target, we also need to include it in the baseline as well, and it wouldn't change anything, it would just change the emission rate number uh, both at the start and the end. And then the other thing is that here is on the right, this table is showing um, in, and you can't really see, uh, but there is a little red line that's showing what the EPA's target is over time. And then there's this blue line underneath which is showing the emissions of the scenario's emission rate over time. And if you could see the red line, you would be able to say, see that it's, uh, flo it's underneath the red line um, for the entire time. It makes these big drops because of large renewable energy projects going on the grid. And then this one in 2020 here is uh, from heat rate improvements at the power plants. And you can see we do most of our work early on in the, in the period, and then we kind of coast into 2030 uh, just underneath the bar in this particular scenario. Um, so um, this uh, tool is designed the same way the EPA designed their uh, target. Uh, so there, each of these tabs is designed to be a different building block. And so there's uh, the, the coal power plants is the first tab after the overview, natural gas, renewables, energy efficiency. There's an other tab here in case we wanted to build a nuclear reactor in the state between now and 2030. I think that's a pretty tight timeline and probably there's a number of issues with that idea, but were you to want to run that in a scenario, you could put it in this particular tab. 
and then ultimately you get to a scenario comparison uh, tab, which will show you all the scenarios up against each other, um, and what their, uh, the different sources of energy they're using, and then also you can have, as with the overview slide, there is a, uh, let's back up just a little bit more, um, a graph here that will show you the emission rate over time for all the scenarios in comparison to each other, and then the mass of emissions over time compared to each other. So to go back to the beginning real quickly, um, this is, or not quite the beginning, this is the, uh, so this is scenario three, and this is one that was requiring more heat rate improvement from the power plants um, than in other scenarios. Uh, but, and so it's requiring a 4% efficiency improvement. The EPA's target was 6%, uh, but that has proven across the country to be uh, roundly considered to be a fairly <coughs> ambitious target. Could you just define heat rate? So that, sorry, yes, so I, I should do that. So heat rate is, you know, how much coal they have to put into the boiler to get one megawatt hour of, of electricity. Um, out at the other end. So it's measured, in, but however much coal you put in is also proportionate to the amount of CO2 you're going to get out. So it is uh, very closely tied. If you make the power plant more efficient, um, and so it uses less coal to generate the same amount of megawatt hours, you're ultimately going to end up with fewer uh, you know, pounds and tons of CO2 coming out of the stack as so long as the generation amount stays the same. So this scenario, 4%, all the efficiency improvements are gonna come in 2020, which is again what the EPA had assumed, but you don't have to stick with that. In your own scenario, you can say, you know, I think that 4% is overly ambitious. You can type 2% in here, press the set button, and it'll change it for all the power plants. Um, likewise, you could tinker with individual power plants and say that you know, units three and four coal strip uh, we think that they have greater potential for improvement, and you can type it in that way. You can change the uh, date in which the efficiency improvement is going to occur. Maybe 2020 is too early. And you think that by buying a little bit more time, they're going to have greater potential to achieve greater efficiencies. Uh, likewise, you could close a plant. That wasn't an idea that was very popular in Coal Strip or uh, Billings, per se, but I feel like there's probably a few people here in the room that are going to be more eager to use this particular column. Uh, we have in this scenario uh, that Corette is, uh, which is scheduled to be mothballed here in 2015, we have assumed for this scenario, and for all five of the scenarios, that that mothball becomes a full closure and it never reopens. Um, so we're modeling it that it, the first year that we fully closed is 2016, and then it will stay closed. Another um, thing that you can do in this particular tab is you can mess around with the percentage output. You can assume, as uh, many might, that uh, 2012 was a really bad coal year. There's was really good hydro, natural gas prices were rock bottom, and so the generating units in the state did not generate uh, as much electricity then as they would normally. So you could also model uh, an increase in their output in the future to better reflect what you feel is you know, the historical average for those power plants. Uh, if you do that, it's going to make it more challenging to meet the target, but that just maybe means you need greater efficiency improvements, more renewables, more energy efficiency, or something else. Likewise, uh, this efficiency improvement uh, column you could also use to model co-firing uh, because natural gas has about half the CO2 of coal uh, to generate the same megawatt hour. If you burn 10% uh, coal or 10% natural gas at the Lewis and Clark plant, you're going to get roughly a 5% improvement. And you think it's probably a little as a result of that. Likewise, uh, as is the case in our scenario five, you could assume that you capture a sequestration project that could net you a 20% improvement at particular units that, where you apply that. Um, one final thing is over here uh, for if you're doing mass-based compliance, you can also assume uh, increases or reductions in exports of electricity. Montana exports about half the electricity that it generates. Uh, sorry, so uh, mass-based uh, where we're achieving compliance through the total amount of tons of CO2 put in the air rather than the emission rate of 
that the EPA had originally set as a target. And so in this particular scenario, in 2016, we show a little bit of an export reduction, and that's associated with the correct plant, clo correct plant closing. Um, we didn't go the whole way. Correct uh, generated 700,000 megawatts. We only put 150,000 megawatts in this one because that's all we needed to get it in compliance. But you could easily say that it's going to be a one-to-one -one reduction, and which you type in 700,000 there instead. Uh, moving on uh, to the next tab, which is natural gas. There, this one is blank because currently we don't have any combined cycle natural gas plants in the state. But that doesn't mean we couldn't in the future and that we couldn't apply that to uh, meet our, uh, our targets. And if you wanted to build a natural, natural gas plant, you could put in yes for the affected facilities uh, column. And uh, you put in uh, your own little plant Let's assume it's a combined cycle plant, um, and that its first operation year will be 2025. It'll be a million and a half megawatt hours, which is roughly a 250 megawatt natural gas plant. And then the last question is, is this going to transfer generation from the coal facilities in the state to natural gas, or is it going to be additional generation above and beyond what's already occurring? Consequently, not affect the, the coal generation in the state. Uh, and so it's just a yes, no question. You say no, this is going to be additional. It's going to result in additional generation um, that, and increase uh, exports out of the state. So uh, the next building block, building block three, which, which, which was renewable energy, there's four different options. Uh, the first one, you can click on this little button here, and you can just assume what the EPA assume, which is uh, that we'll be able to grow our um, electricity, our renewable generation from 1.2 million megawatt hours in 2012 to 20 and 2030 getting 2.7 million megawatt hours. But it should be noted that since 2012, we've already seen increases in our renewable energy generation because of new projects coming online in the last couple of years. In 2014, we're expecting 1.8, 1.9 million megawatt hours. So we're at about 40% of the way to the EPA's target. Another option, which is used in this particular scenario, is to throw out specific projects. Um, the first and last are already in the ground, they're already generating electricity. We have two other large projects that we feel are pretty likely to come online in the next few years uh, if we can uh, keep them moving forward. The third option is to do an incremental yearly increase and just kind of assume that we'll get 50,000 um, new megawatt hours of electricity every year uh, from, from various wind projects, solar, whatever you want to assume. And the fourth is you go over here and you can just input every year's number if you're really into details. Even I'm not that into details, but we made that an option all the same. Uh, and then for the next, the fourth building block, it's the same type of idea over again. Option one, you can use the EPA's estimate. Currently, we're getting about 11 average megawatts of energy efficiency in the state. Um, they think we'll be able to grow that uh, by more than to, to more than double it to somewhere north of 22 to 25 average megawatts uh, between now and really they expect us to get there by about 2022 and be able to stay at that level all the way through 2030. Uh, you could also say we think that is overly ambitious. <coughs> say 50%, 75% of what the EPA assumes, or maybe you think that we could do even more than that, and you could say we're going to do 150% of that. Um, and then the third option, as with the renewables, is you could input that uh, average megawatts of energy efficiency for every year uh, from 2012 going forward, and you can model your own little growth curve of energy efficiency wherever you want. Uh, and, and factor that in that way. The other tab, you can build your own um, nuclear <coughs> plant. You can build a cogeneration facility with low emissions that way, and that would be incorporated into the spreadsheet. Uh, but every time you make changes in any of these tabs, it will ultimately come back. With, if you go back to the overview slide, it's going to change these numbers here. But if you want to see um, how these uh, scenarios compared to each other, your own versus ones that we built, uh, this particular tab, the scenario comparison tab, 
will show you all the numbers, how much energy efficiency the scenarios are getting, how much renewables, and then also we'll show in graph form what all is happening. There's a lot going on right now, so maybe we should simplify this a little, get rid of a few scenarios by just deleting. And you can see on the slide we have in red, we have the EPA's estimate. In green, we have a heavy energy efficiency slide, which is why you're seeing a very smooth line all the way down to 2030 in terms of emission rate reductions. And then in purple, this one's more heat rate improvements, more uh, specific renewable energy projects. And so you're seeing this as a kind of a, a, a chunky drop uh, as it goes down in specific increments as specific projects get implemented. And you can create your own projects, and as I'll say in a second, uh, you have to save a scenario, but once you save it, you can add it in here and just pick a particular scenario and add it, and it'll get added to all the graphs as well. So, at the end of this, you've tinkered with all this, you've come up with a great plan. What you need to do is just type in here on scenario name your own little name for it and press the save scenario uh, button right here. And it'll save the scenario, and you can, for future review, for uh, comparing in, in the scenario comparison tab, um, our, the Bureau of Air Director really requested that in addition to the save scenario, we should really create a delete scenario button uh, in case in the next day when you look at it again, maybe you're not quite so happy. And if you press the delete scenario button, you, it'll, it'll, make sure, it'll ask you a second time whether you really want to get rid of it. But if you say yes, it'll be gone. So through this tool, we uh, were able to get a, a much more uh, fine-grained look at what this particular EPA uh, draft rule means for Montana. And while we don't necessarily have all the answers about how the state's going forward, it's helped us understand what the state's strengths are, and what its weaknesses are, and it's given us places where we have concerns that we've already gone to the EPA with, EPA with and tried to get answers. And it's definitely given us a number of places where we have comments about uh, things that we're concerned with or areas where we feel that the EPA can make a good choice or a bad choice. And we want to help guide them to the good choice that will make this rule work best for Montana. But as I said before, this is a tool that you can find on the TEQ website. We would love for you to, to understand everything that's going on with it right in front of you on the easy to read computer screen. And, uh, so we really would hope to hear comments from you uh, based upon your own analysis using this tool. With that, I'll turn it back over to Tracy uh, to introduce the panel. Thank you, Garrett. Um, and he's not kidding. Uh, I downloaded it at home, and I did not break it. And um, so you can, too. Um, and you know, I think when Governor Bullock asked us to analyze this and say, hey, could you do an analysis? Um, I don't think he expected this. I sure didn't. Um, and so a shout out to my colleagues. We hear a lot um, of negative things about people who work for the government. <laughs> I work with wildly competent coworkers, so thank you, team. Um, and speaking of public servants, we have um, some elected officials in the audience. Could you please raise your hands? Thank you for coming. And I think I saw some delegation representatives. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, okay, panelists. <laughs> Um, I, panelists, I apologize about the mic. It worked in the sound check. Um, so I'm going to leave it to you on uh, whether you want to sit and project or whether you want to stand when you speak. But come on up. It did work really well. Check, 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 check. It might be as simple as a dead battery. That would be good. It works really well. <laughs> Please come up to the front where you can hear. Sir, come right, come right, go ahead, come right up front. You'll be just fine. Okay. Uh, on my left 
is Mary Gail Sullivan. Mary Gail is the uh, Manager of Environmental Permitting and Compliance from Northwestern Energy. Next to her is Rex Rogers. He gets the I Drove the Farthest Award um, for this meeting. He is the Business Manager of Local 1638 <coughs> IBEW at Coal Strip. To his left is Senator Cliff Larson. Uh, the Senator serves as the Chair of the Energy Tech Telecommunications. and Telecommunications Interim Committee, uh, which we fondly know as <coughs> EPIC. Um, to his left is Chase Jones. Chase is the Energy Conservation Coordinator for the City of Missoula. Uh, and next to him is Dan Brandborg. Dan is the General Manager of SBS Solar, a, a solar installing company based here in Missoula. And to his left is David Hoffman. David is the Director of External Affairs, Affairs for PPL. <coughs> Mary Gail, I'm turning it over to you. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> I'm only 5'2", so you might not see me as well as you saw Tracy, but I apologize. Um, as she said, I'm with Northwestern Energy. I'm uh, manager of environmental compliance and permitting. And we've been really working hard to understand um, this very, very complex um, set of proposed standards that the EPA has issued. And we wanted to really take a moment. I apologize my back is to you. But we wanted to really a shout out to the DEQ for the work they have done. Uh, this this is an unprecedented uh, set of uh, proposed standards. You never really, and we haven't, uh, heard about or had um, regulations that are beyond the stack, as we call them. Uh, normally, you would, you'd have regulations that um, regulate just the emitting source. Well, in this case, the solution is beyond the stack, potentially. And um, the reason it's unprecedented is because, if you think about it, um, it's probably the most complex industry energy is um, in the nation, or one of them. And um, you've added, um, all of a sudden, a whole different, a whole number of different um, potential interest parties. Um, it's just a very complex. Uh, situation and the state has done a really nice job of developing this model um, based on the proposed EPA rules and I put an emphasis on proposed because uh, we focused a lot on how the EPA got to the 1771 and the standard for Montana and so that's kind of the, the context of our comments tonight um, and let me let me just say a couple more kind of introductory comments. Um, most of you may know this, but, but so bear with me. Um, the first thing I'd like to say is, you know, Northwestern Energy is, is the, probably the, the main uh, utility that's regulated, the only one really in the state uh, of the size that we have. And so we have a great deal of, at stake with this proposed rule. That's one thing. Um, the Public Service Commission and the, um, by statute in Montana, our supply portfolio is very regulated and has to be a least cost portfolio. That's the law. That's what we have to comply with. Um, Northwestern has been very aggressive over the last several years with energy efficiency. We support it. Uh, we look for opportunities to expand it, um, and basically, when you look at the numbers and look at the energy efficiencies in the white paper, Northwestern makes up probably our customers, all of you in likelihood, um, maybe 80% of those achievements. I don't know if you've got the um, delivery this week with the dollar off the light bulbs. Take advantage of those things. That's part of this good program. Northwestern has also been aggressive with renewable energies. About a third of our uh, average base load has uh, a wind supplies that, uh, 240 megawatts out of 650. 
of our whole portfolio with the hydros, um, about 50% of our portfolio is renewable. Sure. That is out of um, our whole portfolio, about 50%, 51% specifically, is renewables with hydro and wind. Thank you. Um, we have not always been successful in, in trying to promote uh, renewable energy sources. Uh, so many of you may recall um, the Montana or, let's see, yeah, Mountain States Transmission Intertie um, transmission line that proposed was to be built from northern Montana to Idaho, uh, unsuccessful. In part, that was to support wind farms. Um, so there are circumstances that kind of put in context our concerns about this rule. Uh, the other thing I'll mention is that um, Let me see here, I'm getting my thoughts together. Oh, this is an important point. Um, <coughs> I mentioned book that Northwestern uh, is responsible or customers for about 80% of the energy efficiencies. But if you look at the coal resources in the state, the, co the energy generated from coal, Northwestern only owns 8%. You're letting your voice trail off. Sorry. That's, yeah, that's bad. Um, so if you look at the whole um, en energy generated in the state from coal, Northwestern owns 8% of that. How okay. So that's the context of our comments to the EPA. And we have six that I'll just mention real briefly tonight um, that we would like to We'd like really for any of you to make the comments also to the EPA as customers of Northwestern uh, or as concerned citizens, and especially to work with DEQ and the governor's office and the legislature, the Public Service Commission. Um, but our comments, first of all, is we, we believe uh, the state of Montana deserves to get credit for the energy efficiencies and renewable energies that it already has put in place. Right now, um, that isn't the case because you start at a spot and then you build on it. So basically, early performers are sort of penalized in other states, because the building blocks were the same for all 50 states. So other states that are other utilities that haven't been as proactive um, will have an easier time achieving compliance because you know, some of those low-hanging fruit of energy efficiency programs, they'll be able to implement to comply. Um, the other item we think should be included is hydro. Hydro is not included in the denominator that uh, Tracy was showing. Um, we think it should be. Now, what that effectively will do is make it look like Montana has more rigorous goals to achieve, but it's a step change because we'd also be able to take advantage of it as a renewable resource um, to comply with the rules. So we think hydro should, it's, it's an important renewable resource. It should be included, non-emitting. Um, let's see. Oh, we do have a concern about using only one year as the starting spot. We think any time you use just a a one data spot, there's anomalies. So we'd like to see some normalization of our uh, emissions. We don't know, three to five years or a different type <coughs> of spot. Um, we just would like to see more than 2012. Um, two more. We think the building blocks have some contradictions. So if you try to use one to comply, it causes another one to be a problem. And um, Garrett sort of described the heat rate issue. Well, one of the building blocks is to uh, improve your heat rate. Um, 
So that means a more efficient plant, for example, at Colstrom. Or one of the other building blocks is to redispatch the power generated, perhaps, at Coal Strip to either renewables or a combined cycle gas plant. Well, that's going to make you less efficient at Coal Strip with your heat rate. So these contradictory building blocks can create problems for Montana. And the last item that we're concerned with is, is right here in Montana, is the uh, to really work, it's going to take some changes to the law in Montana. So, um, as I mentioned, we're regulated by um, Public Service Commission state law. Um, it would be difficult, I think, for DEQ to enforce um, something that is the responsibility of a different agency under state law. So. Um, we think some laws would have to change. And so these are things we want to be on the table to discuss. Um, our goal is to, to get a workable rule that doesn't un unduly burden our customers. Um, so that's it. And thank you again for letting us come and participate in this tonight. Karen, walk, walk me that mic. Tell me it we'll works. See. Is this helping out? No. I don't think it's helping out. Is everyone back there hearing? Okay. I think it's just the interference from all the other electronics. No, if you're halfway back. Rex, so, uh, you're yeah, closer to. If you're halfway back, you'll be closer to a lot of people. Uh, Rex, Rex Rogers is next, and I failed at the beginning um, to let you know what, what um, the panelists have been talking about. Uh, each evening, we've been in Coal Strip and Billings, um, and each night I ask them to consider what are the potential opportunities of this rule and what are the potential challenges, either for their company or for the state. So that's the context. Rex. So with that, my voice usually projects fairly well. Tell me if I need to speak up. I am more than five foot two, so I think I'll stand back here and make myself a little more comfortable. As a union business manager, I don't necessarily like to have people behind me. <laughs> but, uh, so with that, uh, I would really like to extend the thanks uh, to Governor Bullock and the Montana DEQ with Director Tracy Stone Manning we're moving forward with what I, in a short term, call a state implementation plan. Uh, we need to move forward with the Montana solution to this difficult issue, uh, as important as this issue is, both for the state of Montana, the United States, and the overall issue here that we're dealing with the environmental issue of the global change. So, with that, with the, the guidelines set out, challenges and opportunities. It's interesting to see. I, I want to point out I'm the only invited panelist that's made it to all three of the panels. It's interesting for me to watch the changes that we had uh, in the discussion uh, through the panels. It, it truly is interesting. Um, the first night in Coal Strip, it was all challenges and there weren't very many opportunities. <laughs> I had opportunities. My opportunities haven't changed throughout this discussion. It's nice to see in this process that we're working on in just a short three days that I feel that we've changed our tone to where more people are seeing opportunities and that's what we need is we need opportunities to move forward. So with my challenges, I'd like we have to understand that we have to maintain base load capacity. A significant challenge for renewables is at this point they're not base loadable. That means that when you need electricity at the, at the switch, uh, the renewables cannot always be counted on to be there. Wind usually has about a 30% availability. And it's not necessarily always on Monday morning at 8 o'clock. Oftentimes it'll happen on a weekend. That's just the nature of wind. That's where our technology is right now. So we have to keep in mind that to make this energy plan work, that we have to have base load electricity that is available to keep the system running. 
We need investment in infrastructure and gas, both in transmission lines for electricity and gas lines. Uh, hopefully, uh, this is, I'm sure, a very informed crowd. Um, we've seen issues uh, with our polar vortex in, the, in the, the gas line capacity, for instance, for natural gas. The capacity is there when you don't need it real bad, when it gets cold, when all sources on the gas line start using that resource, then it becomes uh, a limiting uh, source. So if we're going to use natural gas, we've got to get it spread out across the state in a, a usable fashion. And it takes significant capacity to run a unit that you would even be talking about 250 megawatts. Good infrastructure that we need to build, but it's stuff that we need to get done. You know, infrastructure uh, for uh, transmission. Those of you that uh, like renewables, we have to understand, uh, as uh, Mary spoke to with Northwestern Energy, a key component to making renewables work in making it to where wind is blowing in one area but not in another is transmission. An uh, integrated electrical grid with uh, good transmission is key to making that work. We need to invest in that infrastructure. <coughs> So, also, with my, uh, you all know where I come from. I'm from <laughs> Coal Strip. I, we do need to invest in coal. With where we're at with today's technology, with moving forward with making this energy plan work, we look forward to an opportunity, actually the challenge, uh, to make coal better. We need to improve on the way we use coal. Continuing improvement, I've long recognized, is what makes the power plants that I'm part of continue to run. As soon as we don't continue to improve, uh, those are the power plants we're seeing going away. Opportunities. You know, speaking on behalf of uh, skilled labor across the state, there's significant opportunities here. Uh, as skilled labor not only uh, provides work and uh, enjoys the good jobs and the bounties of our state of Montana, <laughs> but we're rate payers too. We're rate payers that uh, strive to stay in the middle class and still meet those electrical bills that we're all facing. You know, the opportunities that we see is that we have the skills to meet all the challenges that I have pointed out to you. You know. Uh, we led the way in the state of Montana, a uh, test bed in Coal Strip, uh, to meet the mercury reductions. Our goals that we had was to come up with a technology that first, we had to get to where we could measure mercury because it's a difficult and small am amount to measure. Uh, then we had to come up with a way <coughs> to, to, to meet the mercury regulations that Montana led the way, set the challenge on to get. Uh, we met that challenge at Coal Strip. Not sure how many people understand, one of the goals that we had in meeting that technology, using activated charcoal and calcium bromide, two very simple elements that we use, one of the goals that we had was to develop a system that was cheap enough that we could possibly share it with other countries in the hope that they would implement it and reduce the effect of mercury on us. Uh, there's other ways that you can control mercury. We picked a way that was relatively inexpensive with readily available uh, materials. So, and, and it's not rocket science. You turn uh, elemental mercury into mercury oxide by rusting it. Then you recapture the rust. Uh, that's the fix, and it seems to be working well. Uh, we're proud of that at Culture. Uh, we, we like challenges. And we're fairly successful at meeting them. You know, across the state, you know, we have the skills and training ability to build the necessary infrastructure, whether it's pipelines or or uh, our electrical uh, infrastructure. All the options that we see here today, all options do require a skilled labor force. No matter where you're at, I would certainly hope, whether you're environmentalist or whatever, we can all agree that skilled 
labor doing these jobs uh, in a way that makes them actually work uh, is the right thing to do. Uh, we want a proper outcome in the end. You know, skilled labor force, you know, is going to range from power plant workers improving the heat rate, making the plants more efficient, linemen and pipe fitters building transmission, to wiremen install, installing efficiency upgrades and building the renewables that we're all looking for. You know, most of all, the opportunity that I see is I see an opportunity for a Montana solution, not a federal solution. To work through this process and getting input for all those that are interested, like we're doing here today, and to develop a plan to form Montana's energy future with a Montana plan. That's how I see it, and uh, like I say, we're committed to, to making this issue work. We want a Montana solution. Thank you. Thank you, Rep. Senator Larson. He has a great speaking voice. He has a future in politics, <laughs> not just in the union. <laughs> uh, I would also like to thank Tracy for the invitation to be here tonight. Um, as politicians, we have a great responsibility to the people of Montana, and you have a lot of great politicians representing you in the legislature. We don't always agree, but we're always aiming to try and find the common good for the people of Montana. And I can tell you, uh, noticing that Professor Running is in the audience tonight, there are days that I damn him, and there are days that I praise him to my friends because hearing a lecture, lecture from him several years ago turned my life around, and basically I was oblivious to the cart. I thought it was in a pencil. And very manageable. Carbon was in a pencil. <laughs> Dr. Running pointed out that it had to do with something tragic and terrible, and that was global warming. And I saw it with my own eyes in a presentation that he did, and it really made me seek out the opportunity to work in the field of energy, because energy is one of the great producers of carbon. And I, I wouldn't dispute a thing that uh, Mary or Rex said with respect to opportunities, and I too have been looking for opportunities as a politician chairing the Energy and Telecommunications uh, Committee and also working as the co-chair of the energy sector of the Pacific Northwest Economic Region, which is five northwestern states and five western Canadian provinces. And I can tell you folks that that is a huge issue before that body as well. We have a gathering of 500 scientists and, and business leaders and politicians from around the area and around the world that have grappled with this in the five years that I've been involved with PINWAR, the organization. But tonight I would like to tell you maybe a little parallel story to the opportunities and challenges that you've heard from, from Mary and from Rex, and that is what your politicians are doing. And you know the old proverb, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. In this case, we really are. The last 15 months, the Energy Committee in Montana has been devoted to studying the renewable energy portfolio standard. And you may well know that in Montana we have a standard that a certain amount of energy that we consume in this state has to be renewable energy. And that standard is 15% by the year 2015. And we're already there, but now I think that many of us, people I see sitting in this room that have worked with me, think that standard is probably too low. But Remembering something Professor Running said, he said it's never too late to change all this, didn't you? <laughs> and he's yeah. nodding his head. <laughs> it's never too late to change this, yeah. and I think that the standard should be raised. Kyla agrees with me, and others sitting in this room. But what we're doing now in the legislature as we move forward, uh, I made a presentation to the Environmental Quality Council two weeks ago, which is a parallel committee that meets in the interim focusing on environmental issues. And the Environmental Quality Council has oversight over Tracy and her organization and that part of government. And that's a tough committee. These committees that, that you 
visit from time to time are made up of equal numbers of Democrats and Republicans. So we can hardly ever get anything done, but when we do, it's usually pretty good. And what we decided to do at the Energy Committee was go to the EQC and say, we need to study this subject, this new rulemaking process, and see if we can not help the executive department, that is the governor, and Tracy and her people find a solution and put it in writing and adopt a plan that as Rex said is for Montana and maybe stretches the limits of the carbon rules that we want to employ and try and find a way to get more renewable energy out for the consumption of our people in Montana. I can also tell you that I'm a great hydro fan. I'm happy that Northwestern Energy is going to take ownership of the large hydro system in this state. I did introduce a bill a couple of sessions ago to force the state of Montana, not your agency, but a different agency to look at all the state-owned dams to see if we couldn't up the generation from each of those particular dams that are controlled or owned by the state. And we found one. We're going to do one, I guess. But at least little incremental changes, a little bit at a time, makes a big difference. And my hope, my desire is that we can work together and find incremental ways to make the carbon footprint more tolerable or make it go away altogether if that's remotely possible. Thank you. Chase from the city of Missoula. Good evening, everyone. I'm really happy that Senator Larson uh, didn't start his talk with saying how tall he was. <laughs> I'm pretty nervous about that. And, uh, <laughs> my therapist on speed dial there to help me <laughs> I'm not going to mention how tall I am, but I am going to try and speak from behind the podium, so uh, if you can't hear me, uh, let me know. I would like to thank Director Stone Manning uh, for inviting me to this discussion on behalf of the City of Missoula. Uh, it's an important conversation with absolutely complex issues uh, to weigh. We appreciate DEQ's work in this arena for sure. Uh, the City of Missoula has worked hard on the issue of energy conservation and reducing our operational emissions and actually have adopted an energy conservation and climate action plan with a goal of carbon neutrality by 2025. City leadership and staff believes that this type of planning and action contributes to clean air and water, is physically responsible, and maintains public health and builds community resilience. There are certainly opportunities as well as challenges with this rule and Montana's implementation of this rule. I'd like to share two of our largest energy conservation projects here in Missoula, uh, both of which I think have legs when considered in the scale of the DEQ paper and the scenarios and building blocks being discussed tonight. Uh, you'll see that our experience with these projects directly speaks to both opportunities and challenges. Uh, first, I'll describe the Green Blocks program uh, that the City of Missoula did in conjunction with Northwestern Energy a public-private partnership and a great one. Uh, Green Blocks was a residential energy efficiency pilot, uh, uh, again, in conjunction with Northwestern Energy and their demand-side management program. Uh, in short, Green Blocks engaged the residents of 300 homes in Missoula for comprehensive energy audits, basic weatherization retrofits, and in qualifying cases, free insulation in either basement crawl spaces, uh, walls, or attic, um, and in a lot of cases, all three. The cumulative results of Green Blocks uh, were pretty impressive. Uh, nearly 125,000 kilowatt hours and over 7,000 decatherms uh, were saved per year, which saved residents nearly $65,000 annually uh, with that one pilot project. Not, not small change, uh, in our opinion. <coughs> Um, as a side note, uh, on insulation, to qualify for free insulation in the Green Blocks program, uh, the participants basically had to have little to no insulation existing. Uh, in our program, and kind of to our surprise, 71% of the homes that we worked with qualified for that free insulation. I, I kind of point that out because it really drives home the opportunity out there in energy efficiency. Uh, we found it here in Missoula, uh, probably in other places as well. Uh, so I, I feel the Green Box model, uh, or something akin to it, scaled up to the statewide level 
presents a huge opportunity in terms uh, of the state of Montana achieving the energy efficiency portions of the scenarios outlined uh, in the paper uh, that we're discussing tonight. One other note to take that a little further, uh, we had hopes to extend green blocks beyond uh, the one year, um, and we actually had hopes to extend it past the residential sector um, and, and scale it up to a, a business and commercial component as well. I think this represents uh, an even greater opportunity uh, in the state of Montana, and if that could be Im implemented, um, I, I think that impact uh, could be pow powerful. So just to talk a little bit about challenges with the Green Blocks program, uh, it basically lies in funding, uh, which isn't uh, uncommon to all of us in the room that have worked on these types of projects. Uh, even with the tremendous payback that we all know energy efficiency represents, it still takes money to implement. Uh, the Green Blocks pilot was funded, as I said, in partnership with Northwestern Energy, 50-50, uh, right down the middle. Uh, so the first funding challenge um, was our own, the city of Missoula. Uh, our portion was funded by a federal grant called the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Block Grant, uh, which unfortunately was a one-time opportunity. We sure had hopes that uh, it would be more than one time, but um, that, that did not happen. Um, the second funding challenge was, was had to do with the other half uh, of the funding of the Green Blocks, uh, generously contributed by Northwestern Energy in their demand side management program. Um, in, in order uh, for that program uh, and, and that funding source um, to be expanded or continued, it had to pass what's called the total resource cost test. Um, again, to, to warrant continued contribution or expansion. I'll, I'll speak up, I'm sorry. Um, so while the program was successful and saved residents money and certainly saved energy, it did not save enough to meet the stringent requirement of Northwestern Energy's demand side management regulation and that total resource cost test. So that left the city of Missoula without the great partner that Northwestern Energy was and leaving us unable to do large scale energy efficiency programs like Green Blocks on our own. Next, I'd like to mention uh, another opportunity in the building block of solar energy and photovoltaics and also um, kind of specifically in the net metering arena. Um, in the Energy Conservation and Climate Action Plan uh, that I mentioned earlier, we knew uh, the task force that designed that plan uh, and, and the city leadership knew we could not reach our carbon neutrality goal without deploying a healthy amount of renewable energy. In fact, we dedicated an entire chapter to strategies around that. We since built a new downtown parking structure park place, which you're probably familiar with. Um, it was designed very obviously and sort of iconically uh, with a large solar array that essentially covers the top floor of, of the parking structure. In designing that system, we learned how great net metering was as a tool for solar deployment. And we were absolutely grateful that net metering existed and, and um, wanted to, con to continue to exist, obviously. Um, I mention this, again, to point out what a great opportunity net metering is. What we also learned was there was a portion of state statute that puts a 50 kilowatt cap on solar array generation. This cap limits the city's ability to power buildings 100% by solar power, which would go a long way in achieving our carbon neutrality goal, uh, as I mentioned in the kind of beginning of this, of this introduction. Um, I know the DEQ scenarios don't speak directly to this type of renewable energy application, but uh, we do feel it represents both an opportunity and a challenge uh, in that building block, block of, of, of this proposal um, for consideration. Um, again, I am happy to have the opportunity to speak to you tonight on this issue while planning for Montana's energy future, uh, especially one that takes into account clean air and water, healthy communities, <coughs> and a healthy economy. Thank you. Uh, before I left um, Missoula for Helena for this job, I was a participant in the Green Blocks program at my home. Thank you. Yeah, you're rocked. <laughs> I mean, my house was warmer, my bills went down. Like, what's not to like? Yeah, yeah thank you. Dan, Brenborg, please. Thank you.
you, Tracy. I think I'll just step up here. I'm kind of used to being on the front line. I'm uh, Dan Bramborg, SBS Solar. I'm a photovoltaic guy. That's just renewables. Let's just uh, drill down in renewables. You know, and photovoltaics is our specialty, and it's a very applicable, as we many of us know, in, here in Montana. Um, I started in photovoltaics 33 years ago when we were working with little 33 watt panels for uh, $15 a watt. Um, today we're selling a 300 watt module for a dollar a watt. So solar is ready for part of this challenge. It's not going to do the whole thing. The base load, very important. We can't run at night very well without <laughs> storage, right? But we can handle a good percentage of what we're talking about here. Um, I travel outside of the state for trainings and conferences and such, and, and I come home to Montana, and I am amazed at how behind we are when it comes to deploying photovoltaics. I mean, this is a super little energy source that's part of our solution. And we are behind the curve. So to me, challenges, nah. Opportunity, yes. We have some opportunity here. The federal government, these projections, these ideas, great. Let's go for it. We can do it. We have brought the technology along. Um, we look at the incentive process around, uh, around us. And I mean, a complete circle. Of course, we the Washington, Oregon, California. You know, we have the federal tax credit, we have a state tax credit for $500 a taxpayer, uh, you know, that's that's minimal <coughs> compared to all our neighbors. And we go around, now we are in a little island here of the Dakotas, Wyoming, and us, but if we go outside of that loop, and if we go across the ocean, uh, Germany, uh, who has pretty low solar irradiation, uh, a few years ago, updated information had more photovoltaics deployed than any other country in the world in a Seattle-esque type environment. So uh, continue around, Canada has incentives. So here we are, we are, we are resource rich, great, but let's, let's bring this in. Photovoltaics, uh, great with labor, uh, is uh, we can distribute the uh, power production. There are a lot of uh, advantages in that way. Uh, I'm a board member of Ravala County uh, Habitat for Humanity, and this spring we, uh, we uh, completed a home which was one of the first net zero homes in Montana. Um, I'm sure there's a few out there, but we don't, we're, they're not very well publicized. But in that, this home we built a 1,300 square foot house uh, with a very well insulated shell, um, LED lighting, new appliances, heat pump. We brought no gas into that home, and with a seven and a half kilowatt solar array, we have not using power in this house. Now we're going to see because everybody's lifestyle is a little different, so we don't have control on who's running the thermostat and such. But we're real close. We've got enough credits built up from this summer that uh, I think we'll make her to Christmas or so uh, to be at the big zero. It's, it's possible, and we can do it, and we can do it by giving people jobs. We've got to incorporate efficiency. Anytime I sit down with uh, uh, a client, I'm on the front lines uh, putting these systems in, and we talk about efficiency. The efficiency just makes sense. The average U.S. Montana, I think, is right in there, nine megawatt hour per year to run a house. That uh, net zero house, we brought down to four megawatts. That's how we make photovoltaics work. So hand in hand with efficiency, of course. Can't do it ourselves. No, and we do have a great future here. Our module prices still are creeping down. And if we could get energy storage, that's huge. But we've been talking about that for I've been talking about for decades. I say, don't buy those batteries that last for 20 years because we're going to have a new technology. Well, here we are, you know, and uh, we're now, you know, just getting some electric vehicle batteries that are that are decent. So when we get storage, and that's really future stuff. But now, solar is ready. Solar can be a part of this. Um, 
It's uh, solar. You, just to give you some real quick numbers, you know, uh, Seattle. Seattle, we use a, a figure of equivalent full sun hours. Seattle is about two. Germany is about two equivalent full sun hours, average per year. Phoenix, 6.5. Whole lot of heat. Whole lot of sunlight year round. What's Montana? Four and a half to five. We, it is doable. It is it's doable on uh, small scale and large scale. We need to get on it. And I hope that with this rule we can uh, promote this and, and let solar do take a bit of the shoulder on this, uh, this opportunity. So uh, I just think this is great stuff and it's fun to be here talking to people of all varieties to put this together. Thanks. Thank you. David. Hello, Missoula. Can you hear me in the back? Yeah. It's always great to be here, especially when you leave Helena in a raging snowstorm as we did this morning. We go drive into the Clarkport Valley in the sunshine and 60 degrees. Uh, also good to come up here and see my daughter, my youngest, who's a third year student at the U, um, as I was, both undergraduate and law school. And I noticed that she becomes more enlightened every day than she's been. <laughs> I'm David Hoffman, Director of External Affairs for PPL Montana. For those of you who may not know, PPL Montana owns and operates the 154 megawatt coal plant in Billings, which is scheduled for reserve status shutdown in April of 2015. And we also own about 26% of coal strip and operate it on behalf of all six owners, employing about 400 people down there directly, and across the state about 3,700 jobs, according to an economic analysis done by Dr. Colson and Dr. Barton. I have to agree with just about everything I've heard from the panel today. Um, I'm going to touch upon just a couple of challenges, as you might guess. Um, the direction the governor's office and DEQ laid out when they announced the white paper um, was one that anticipated keeping coal plants running, and we applaud that. We appreciate that direction and believe it's in the best interest of Montanans and Montana's economy to keep the coal industry working. However, with this rule or this proposed rule, um, what we see in its complexity is the possibility of unintended or hidden consequences that could actually create reduction in the operation of the coal plants or even some of these plants shutting down. I think it's important that we get all the knowledgeable parties and stakeholders together in this discussion and uh, learn from each of them about their piece and the building blocks and how those can come together to ensure that we fully understand the implications of the rule. We need to conduct an economic analysis of the impacts and the benefits of what this rule might bring for Montanans. The Chamber of Commerce, the Montana Chamber of Commerce recently uh, um, released some numbers, I can't, I can't tell you how these numbers were arrived at, that talked about a 26% increase in the price of electricity to the Montana ratepayer with the implementation of this rule. One other scenario that, that has been proposed um, identifies carbon capture and sequestration at coal strip units three and four as a possibility. As an example, our knowledge of this technology, uh, based upon research studies and industry testing, indicates that carbon capture and sequestration is not commercially available nor cost effective to reducing carbon. We hope that the DEQ will consider energy um, efficiencies that have already been installed at Coal Strip, for example, over the last uh, 10 years or since 20, 2005, that have resulted in significant decreases in carbon emissions. With that, my promise to keep it short, Director, I want to thank you and DEQ for um, making a spot on the panel for PPL but also for holding these public meetings and, and bringing the public in to uh, provide comments and, and start this discussion. We look forward to it. Thank you. Um, so we just 
threw a whole lot of information at you um, uh, that I hope you can take home and digest. Um, and I expect you have some questions and or um, comments, which we'll open it up to now. With me is my colleague, um, Dave Klemp. Dave runs the Air Bureau at the Department of Environmental Quality, so the writing of this compliance plan will be on his and his shop's <coughs> shoulders. Um, so we'll open it up to Q&A, um, certainly of the state and uh, as <coughs> uh, the panelists. And I know many hands are going to shoot up and I'm going to try <laughs> and make sure that I get it in some kind of order, but it's not going to happen. The guy in the brown jacket. That's you. Is it green? It's green. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was bull hunting at green on the blue one view yesterday and heard about the herring. I had my uh, council and friendly suit with me, so I put it on a cane. I'm Joe Valiant. I'm a former state senator, CPA, uh, graduate from the University of Montana as a National Merit Scholar. Uh, right now, I'm the state policy director for Americans for Prosperity in Montana. And uh, I have a question, but I need to preface it with a few comments. Uh, my question is going to deal with the costs of meeting these EPA regulations, the cost to uh, Montana businesses and Montana families. And I was pleased that uh, David Hoffman at least addressed the cost issue when he cited the study. Uh, and there is uh, research that indicates that this may cost as much as a 26% increase in, in energy bills to Montana families and Montana businesses. And um, I'm sure that some of you know that right now over one-fourth of Montanans already devote 22% of their after-tax budgets to energy. And if we have another 26% increase on top of that, I believe it's going to really hurt Montana families. And in addition, it's going to be a double whammy because I believe it's going to affect job growth in Montana if businesses indeed have a 26% increase in cost. For those reasons, my organization, Americans for Prosperity in Montana, opposes the president's new EPA regulations. And we would urge the governor to rather than seek four or five different ways to uh, meet those regulations, to consider taking a step back and oppose those regulations uh, and try to see the targets change. With that, I'd like to ask other members of the committee, other than Mr. Hoffman, who already talked about the 26% increase, to address those concerns. And has there been consideration about how this is going to affect both expenditures for working Montana families, a 26% increase and their income wage growth as a result of these uh, draconian increases in energy costs. Mr. Bell, thank you. I'm happy to take a stab at that. Um, and I'm very happy to start a conversation with the Chamber about the their 26% number. I don't know how they arrived at that because we don't have a plan. Um, and in order to analyze what the costs are going to be, we need a plan, um, which we don't have yet. But surely part of the public conversation will have to be what's the cost, what's the benefit. Um, and I suspect that what we'll hear, as we've heard in um, the first couple of communities we've been in, that it's a real value that we want to pursue uh, a, a least cost path. Um, so that's why some of the energy efficiency numbers you saw, although very uh, difficult perhaps to ramp up to, are so important because it will cost the ratepayer um, the least amount. Right? In fact, potentially even save money for the ratepayer. So those are things that we um, have to dive into and look into. Um, and I think that that analysis comes as we go and as we, um, first of all, we need to know what the final goal is. This is just a draft. And then we need to figure out a plan around that final goal and us, um, attach associated costs with that. Yes? Hi, um, my name is Kyla Mackey. I'm with the Montana Environmental Information Center, and I do want to um, echo some of the panelists for applauding DEQ for taking the step to, you know, address the challenge or the opportunity prevented or uh, promoted or established by the um, Environmental Protection Agency. I think there is a lot of opportunity there. Um, we we think that the plan, our DEQ's proposal, is a good place to start. Um, and that there's not only opportunity in economic development, but there is opportunity in reducing energy costs as well. And I'm glad the energy cost issue was brought up. Um, the Chamber of Commerce estimate, I don't know where they got their analysis because it's difficult to find on their website where they got their number, um, but they actually did put that number out 
before EPA's rules was even proposed. So we don't know where they got the number, but we know when they put that 26% estimate out there. They clearly have um, an agenda to scare the American public into thinking that energy efficiency is going to be more expensive than um, what <coughs> the path that we're currently on. And then also I would just, one comment, um, suggestion, kind of a missing piece, and I think Dan Brandborg mentioned this in, in kind of DEQ's proposal, is missing the opportunity in distributed generation. It's not necessarily addressed in the current um, <coughs> pathways. There is a lot of opportunity there. We know distributed generation, particularly solar energy, is the fastest growing energy resource of the United States today. Um, it's grown much faster than anybody has ever expected, even in the context of low natural gas. So that's something that moving forward um, is a realistic assessment um, to consider um, in how Montana uh, might meet EPA's goals that are set out. Hi, this is Mark Lambrecht with the Treasure State Resource Industry Association in Helena. And I just wanted to say uh, kudos to your staff for putting together um, and, and framing the discussion. I've been pestering Dave and your staff for quite some time now. It's nice to see this and think it frames it rather well. I just have a suggestion and a question. My suggestion is oh, on, please. Uh, on okay, is on scenario five, existing energy generation plus CO2 sequestration. My suggestion would be to remove the sentence mineralization as a proven process for at least partial removal of CO2 from gas streams. The reason I would suggest that is there are other technologies that are farther along than mineralization. Mineralization isn't proven. It, it has been proven in the laboratory and it was used on a partial uh, basis at the Jim Bridger plant in Wyoming with the University of Wyoming analysis states clearly that it was on a small scale and is not ready for the field. My question is, and Mary Gail Sullivan framed this rather well, the paradox about efficiencies. And so on the one hand, and, and David Hoffman referred to this as well, uh, coal plants in Montana are subject to a variety of other EPA regulations, including regional haze and the MATS rule, and control technologies to comply with those rules could decrease the efficiency at those plants before we even get started with requiring increased efficiency to comply with this rule. So my question is, would the department entertain consideration of a question or a comment to EPA to address that paradox? Could perhaps the coal plants start from a different point at which they've complied with those other rules and we set the efficiency at that point and then look for those efficiency gains going forward? Uh, thank you. And uh, on your comment, there, like I said, I'm happy. We are having a discussion over, over things like mineralization. It is for discussion purposes, so thank you. Um, and in answer to your question, it's certainly something we'll look at. Um, and it's something that other states are grappling with. Um, states that have a lot of natural gas plants, Building Block 2 says well, you should dispatch uh, much more of that gas. Will they ramp up some of those gas plants? And then they, then they pop up against um, sulfur dioxide emissions. And so, I mean, there are some difficulties that um, everybody has to contend with. And it's something that the governor will sure look at in his comments. Yes. My name is Jan Hall. <clears throat> I'll speak up. I'm often accused of having a very soft voice. Um, I'd like to thank you, Director Manning, uh, Stone Manning, and the governor for the work they have done. I want to talk mainly about the health uh, issues. And if you want to see the specific gains that are made in health by reducing the emissions, look in the EPA uh, document this long when it has a section called By the Numbers and a lot of huge advantages, millions and millions of dollars, and health events. Uh, covered. If we're really serious about reducing pollution and addressing climate change, we have to stop burning coal. Emissions from burning coal are responsible for four out of the five main causes of death in America. Lung disease, heart disease, strokes, and some cancers. In kids, lung disease usually comes forward as asthma. 
I was an EMT in a rural area for many years. And when we transported these young children or their parents, because it also comes out in young adults, it was terrifying to see the look in their eyes as we may have to use a paralytic so that we could intubate them and breathe for them for a one-hour transport to a hospital. 8% of Montana's kids have asthma. That's 1 in 12. Asthma, asthma has doubled in children over the last 40 years. It used to be that we didn't see anyone in a classroom who had asthma. Now there are two or three children in every classroom. And asthma doesn't just attack and go away. It damages lungs, and the damaged part does not come back. It's a progressive disease and is exacerbated by burning coal. What is the health of our kids worth? We can, re oh, can we reduce more CO2 emissions from burning coal than this plan asks for? When we were shown the, the form to fill out, if you had reduced it more, it, showed, it came up in red if you reduced over. It seems like we ought to be able to do better than what this plan proposes. I believe we must. We need to ask ourselves throughout this process, is this we can, the best we can do for future generations? I would, um, I would suggest that you make those comments to the EPA, because it sounds like um, you, uh, you want the target to be different, and so I would comment that to the EPA. Senator Barrett. A comment and a question. The comment is, uh, I think uh, that it would be far more comprehensible to have these standards stated in terms of mass rather than rate. Um, and the reason for that is that really it's the change in mass uh, or the, imp the impacts on mass that uh, tell us what's going to happen in coal production and also tell us what's going to happen in terms of climate impact. Um, our rates can change a lot uh, without much change in mass, and the effects are, uh, are therefore hard to understand. So I, I would urge that um, going forward that we begin to talk about this in terms of mass goals instead of rate goals. Um, that's just a, a comment. The question I have is this. Uh, I, you mentioned that uh, we will be, that presumably one of the things that we want to do is, is find a least cost path. Um, to meeting these goals, however they're stated. Um, and the EPA rules um, allow for both interstate um, compacts um, for meeting the goals and also allow for the possibility of, of a regional cap and trade. Both of those are um, ways of lowering the overall cost. Um, that is by uh, casting your net wider in a region uh, you can reduce the cost of, um, of of meeting the goals for the region as a whole, and cap and trade has the effect of seeking out the and, and rewarding the strategies that, that that are at least cost. So my question is, um, will you be looking at those two opportunities um, going forward? I'm going to address your comment first, which is um, our model has mass based as well. Um, and again, I'm proud of our team. Many of the states are looking to the EPA to, to, for that math conversion. How should we do it? How should we do it? We just did it. Um, and then we said to the EPA, Here, here's how we're going to do it. And, uh, and they seem okay with it. Um, uh, secondly, yes, that's something we will look at. We need to, A, we need a final rule to, to know what number we're dealing with. And we need to have a really clear understanding of what it would take to meet that goal in state before we make um, uh, a decision collectively about whether it makes sense to get into uh, some sort of multi-state relationship, but that's absolutely on the table. In the back. I have several things I want to talk about briefly. Um, when you first started, you mentioned that everything was on the table. Um, and I don't think that's really accurate. Um, from everything I can see in the white paper, um, closing down the coal plants and really going another direction is not on the table. Um, that building block's there all the way across the board. Another thing that's not on the table is for Montana to try and do something exceptional. We all think of ourselves as 
exceptional people, this is an exceptional place. But as the speaker said earlier and, and started pointing towards maybe we ought to do a little bit more, you directed her to the EPA. And I don't think that's correct. Um, there's not one reason in the world that you can't do better than the standard the EPA sets for you. You can aim higher. Um, yes, it would be nice to see the EPA set the standards higher, but there's no reason you have to wait for them to do so. Uh, we heard comments also about coal being a least cost source. Well, as the gentleman from PPL pointed out, it's a least cost source only because coal isn't paying the cost of cleaning up its own mess. Uh, if we took 100, and there's no way they don't have the ability to do that or the method. Um, if coal had to clean up its own mess, or for that matter, pay all the societal costs that all of us are expected to bear as a result of allowing those that carbon to continue off in the atmosphere, allowing that to be dumped in the atmosphere continuously, it would be the most expensive source around. Uh, there was a comment about the need for baseload earlier. Um, there's a solution to the baseload situation as well, and that's the smart grid. Um, there was a mention that the wind isn't blowing here all the time, and you're right. But some place in this big country, the wind is almost always blowing. You link throughout the country with smart grid, do a lot more um, with solar, and we can come an awful lot closer and meet much higher standards. Um, and you know, I also appreciate that there's been repeated attempts to drive wedges um, between the unions and the environmentalists over this issue. Um, building that smart grid is all going to require the skilled labor that the unions supply. Um, the efficiencies that we install in the homes are all going to require the skilled labor that the unions supply. Um, quite frankly, I think the environmentalists and the unions um, pretty much are on the same side. Um, the union members also have kids that get asthma. Um, they live in homes that get flooded or burned over. Um, this is a huge issue and it requires a really serious, aggressive approach. Um, and I'm sorry, but just doing the minimum isn't enough. I would like to second the comments of the previous speaker, but I'd also like to um, raise some pertinent questions about this 26% cost. It was tossed out earlier. That uh, uh, lacks credibility if it doesn't address uh, the savings that uh, could result from uh, this program. Uh, secondly, uh, it would also uh, be more credible if it would address a specific alternative and uh, instead of one figure of 26%, uh, and there ought to be five different cost figures, but they all ought to deal with the savings and uh, the savings in health alone. Uh, well, Ben uh, said the uh, health of people is pretty hard to put a dollar figure on, but um, we know that the medical costs are very real and and should be considered. Uh, but there will be there would be other costs too, such as the, the losses to agriculture. Agriculture is just as important, if not more important, to our economy than uh, production of coal. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I think you'll see in the white paper um, uh, jobs numbers associated with each of the um, each of the economic analysis or each of the scenarios. Um, and and some dollar figures associated with that. Again, it's just a it's just the start. And you're right. When as we move forward, we need to dig deep on those economics. Now in the back. Thanks, Tracy. Uh, as a former modeler, um, analytical modeler, um, in an earlier life, I was really impressed by the the analysis. Thank you. And really congratulate the the team that worked on that. Um, there is. Uh, tying into a couple of the earlier comments, there, 
There is a, a suggestion. I have three requests to the department. One is that you modify the cost-benefit analysis, and specifically, I would like to have you take into account the benefits that accrue to society in general uh, in the reduction of carbon dioxide in its own right. Uh, and for instance, under scenario one, uh, which would reduce CO2 emissions by 7.0 billion pounds per year on, uh, on and after 2030, uh, using numbers from the EPA, the Council on Economic Advisors, and the Department of Trans Transportation, this reduction will result in annual savings of 19 and a half billion to almost 400 billion a year, million dollars a year. Now that's a benefit, a real benefit of the reductions in this plan, which is not brought out in the plan. And I think it needs to be brought out, it needs to be weighed against the other costs, and it needs to be a source of pride for us as Montanans, and a source of you know, pride uh, on the part of our governor. My second suggestion is that there be a, uh, uh, an additional scenario added. The five scenarios that are presented ask the question, how can Montana satisfy the minimum and inadequate standards set by the EPA? I submit that it's appropriate to ask a different question, in that we ask Governor Bullock to consider uh, the answer to the question, how much can Montanans contribute to CO2 reduction? And I think that would follow... I think it would follow easily from this document. This has, the white paper has the seeds of it. For instance, we could take the strongest portions from each of the scenarios there, the viable scenarios. The emissions rate improvement from scenario two, the renewable generation of scenario four, and the energy efficiency savings of scenario one. If we did that, I can't calculate what the additional savings would be, but it would be at least double the seven, uh, what is it, a billion pounds of CO2 per year savings. And if that was done, if that was done, there would automatically accrue benefits between 19.5 million and 400 million dollars. And that would be something that we as Montanans and the governor could go forward with boldly and with, with pride. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> the workers that build transmission lines, we represent the workers that move it on the rail cars. We represent craftsmen that go in and rebuild the plants. We also represent the workers that build windmills. And we have taken a strong position in support of both renewables and our traditional resources. But what I think is important here is that we focus on what the goal is. And I'm not going to change the goal. I'm not going to take an approach that I'm an ostrich sticking my head in the sand and saying, we're going to wait for this to go away, or a lawsuit is going to challenge it and on a technicality, and it will disappear in two or three years. I'm also not going to take the approach that we can do something that's so extreme that we'll never accomplish it. We cannot afford, on an issue as big as this, to look like the United States House of Representatives. <laughs> we have to find something in the middle that will work. And the middle, folks, is working towards what is in our options to meet the goal we have. And as far as issues with a smart grid, I happen to agree with the gentleman, but I want you to know that when we were pushing the issue, which some people in the room will be supportive of and some will be against, but addressing issues on eminent domain, the alliance, the coalition that was opposing us was very conservative Republicans, out-of-state landowners who were funding both sides, and environmentalists. You cannot address the grid issue. You cannot address wind, folks. You can't do it without transmission. So if we're going to 
in one sense say, here's the holy grail. Uh, we're going to build more wind power. You can't do it without addressing issues in the safe house plan. You can't do it without addressing issues in, in transmission. And it, that's a big tax. So my ask of people, it's easy. I have stood on many picket lines. I have protested many issues. It's easy to, to block something. It's a hell of a lot harder people to find a solution. And I'm going to tell you that I'm one of the, probably other than Rex and the staff, that took the time out of my life, and this is a very busy time of the year for the labor movement, to go to all three listening sessions. There were 225 people in an auditorium in the Cold Strip School scared to death. And they have every reason to and they're proud of their community. And they would challenge any community, including Missoula, to compare to their community of 2,300 residents that have what they have as city parks, as schools. They are very proud of it. And so they're proud of what they do. And if you don't think they'll fight for it, of course they will. But I want you to know the labor movement went out not this week. We went out in April and May and talked to our leadership and our members in seven different communities, including here, and talked about this rule coming down and that we needed to find a solution. But I urge you, I urge you, look for a solution. I will tell you the labor movement is a great friend. I will tell you we're a pretty tough enemy, too. We want a solution. I hope you do, too. Thank you. So our universities, our cities, our industries, our larger commercial businesses can take advantage of net metering. And also with regard to Chase's comments about the 300 homes that were insulated in Missoula and the, your requirements being too high at Northwestern to take advantage of that, what I'm, what I'm looking for from Northwestern is many of us stood up for you and supported the purchase of the dams at, the, at a price that the Consumer Council and others really trusted. We stand up for you as an important industry to this day, but we want you to partner with us to achieve some of the goals for our health, for our environment, and for the future, of, the economic future of this state because of the many jobs that be, can be created as we diversify. So what is Northwestern willing to do? Thanks for that question. Um, okay, you're uh, you're fine. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> you can go if you want. <laughs> Would you explain net metering just a little bit so that the term is clear? You know, and I'm the worst person in the world to ask because I'm really you're not, on the hot seat. Exactly. Sorry, I'm not. I have very little knowledge about it. I can, I can explain it real quickly. Great. Net metering is just the process where you take your power that you generate on site, run it into your meter, you run it backwards and basically make credits for that power. And you and the way the law is set that we can anything we use we can offset and put that power back in. We can't sell at this time. We can't ever make money, get money from Northwest Energy, but we can put back as much as we take. And we have a 50 kilowatt system cap right now on the size of a system. I believe that's a, some of the questions here. Is that, is that so, so job, we're the limit to low <laughs> universities and cities and, you know, yeah. to take advantage of it. And so we could encourage a lot of renewables if we could increase that limit. We're going to propose that in the legislature. Will Northwestern Energy step forward and support us in that? And will you, you know, help us get your requirements to a level where more people can take advantage of insulating their homes and doing things that will conserve energy? Yeah. And yeah, those are great points, and uh, as far as supporting in the legislature, that's something I know is being considered. I can't say whether that's 
the company's position at this time or not. But what I can say is with regards to 111 b and the climate change, we are as interested in, as you are is to finding a workable solution. And um, our, our goal, um, similar to Al, is, is not to say no. That is, and our, Bob Rowe has told us, we need to look, even in our comments, look for ways that will work, not say no. And so that's our goal right now, is to find a, a 111B solution that is workable, realistic, and does not have a huge financial burden on our customers. Um, so in that context, I think we're, we're, we're willing to look at any of the scenarios you have put forth. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I want to thank you for coming to Missoula, and I want to thank you for writing such a really um, a thoughtful document, getting us started on this discussion. We're late. Um, but I really think this, this document goes well. And there were two things that stood out to me. One was in scenario one, if I read it correctly, you identified the means to a 17% decrease in energy consumption in the state. And, and that's very, very impressive. Um, and then in scenario four, um, you, you sketched a fairly easy pathway to increasing wind generation by 3.5 times over what we have going now. And that's very, very impressive. And I want to thank you for that. I have two questions. One, and I'll ask you both and then sit down. One, I'm wondering why uh, residential so solar isn't considered very prominent in this document. You know, we've heard tonight that it's very popular with people, particularly in, in considering debt metering. Um, and the second thing is, why aren't there any wind farms going in in southeastern Montana where the, the workers may be uh, threatened with losing their jobs? Why don't we create a plan that creates jobs in southeastern Montana while the coal is dissipating? We're, we're ramping up um, alternative energy and wind farms and all the union work that our brothers and sisters in southeastern Montana need. Thank you for the question, and, and folks, if you can't hear me, please raise your hand. Um, first of all, the document doesn't preclude the use of solar. Um, the document was basically produced to show how much of a certain subset of energy would we need to produce in that block in order to show compliance. Now, what we've learned over the last couple of days, and I was very interested in the solar presentation today, is that there is opportunity to take some credit through the development of a plan and maybe towards energy in the future for solar. Now there's a couple different ways it could be factored in as you mess with the model. You could do it under scenario three as a renewable <coughs> energy, or what I'm feeling is the best option is to look at the solar that is generated and use it under scenario four under energy efficiency and look at the generation or the uh, energy that was avoided being consumed by the presence of that solar. And so what we need to do is get some of the numbers, and I've learned about 50 kilowatt caps and net metering and all of the types of things that are out there. There may be some legislation that was established um, trying to, uh, under certain intentions, and what we can do in the planning period is factor in the legislation, but also look as to what's reasonable and implementable. And, and I think it's the same response with the wind farms. There are some, and Garrett mentioned, we're roughly 30%, I think he mentioned, towards the number that EPA used in establishing the target, but we're not necessarily sure that that represents um, the end all. Um, there's a lot of issues to citing um, any renewables like wind, and we have to factor that in. But I think we can, as we craft the plan, look at those um, projects that are on the drawing board versus those that might be out until 2030 and try to project as best we can as we submit this plan. Thank you. Tracy, can I add something to that? Sure. A specific question. Uh, one of the things that's in the plan is a discussion about the upgrade of the transmission line. Can you speak uh, up? The Bonneville Power Administration uh, line is, 
its potential of I think eight percent upgrade, you know, capacity upgrade. That would allow for some additional transmission that could go from southeastern Montana. But right now they don't have the capacity unless they have some type of system that is what's called firming that can pull power into it during slow times. The other issue that I want to bring up because it came up the two prior nights, or at least one of them is MDU has some windmills in southeastern Montana and where they built them, if they were to go back in there and if the sage grouse plan goes forward as, as is expected, if they build them now and there's a decrease in the sage grouse population, they are subject to the potential of having to shut those down. And I think it's about a million dollars an hour. Somebody might know more than that, more than I do, but it's a significant investment for somebody to stick the tower up on, on the grid where they can get it and use it and have somebody come in and this is the discussion that is going on about the differences in federals and state laws and how they're going to impact this. They're not going to invest in that if the potential is they have to shut them back down. And so we have to find solutions to that. <coughs> so as you can hear, many complications, um, um, but also um, quite a bit of opportunity. Um, so. This is the very beginning of what's going to be a long path, and I want to thank everybody for joining us this evening. We're going to stay around a little bit longer for um, Q&A, but um, you've given us two hours. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for coming. Thank you.